This is a video of a trip to the fascinating city of Beijing, China. We flew across much of Canada over its prairies and rocky mountains to the Vancouver airport where we were able to marvel at the giant aquarium before boarding our Air China plane to Beijing. We disembarked at Beijing Airport's enormous Terminal 3 that was built in part for the Beijing 2008 Olympic Games. The airport is some 32 kilometers northeast of Beijing city center, but fortunately it is serviced by a Beijing subway line that took us right downtown to where our hotel was located. Our hotel was located in the Suzu Hutong, which has a lot of shops and services including a barber shop and a friendly little restaurant where we took most of our meals. The restaurant staff spoke no English and we know Chinese, but they had a menu with a literal English translation that was somewhat helpful. The restaurant patron and staff got a kick out of watching us trying to use the chopsticks to eat. From the railway station, it was easy to get to the Summer Palace on Beijing's modern subways, given its English signage. On the July day that we visited the Summer Palace, it was a very hot 40 degrees Celsius, which made sweating the order of the day as we made our way mainly by foot up, down and around the palace grounds. Fortunately, there was a break from walking in the heat when we took a short ferry trip across the Kunming Lake. Near the entrance is the attractive Suzu Street, built for the Emperor to imitate the markets of the water town south of the Yangtze River. The Four Great Regions area is a group of Tibetan Lama temple buildings set atop a hill reached by a steep stairway. There is a good view from the hilltop out over Beijing in one direction and Kunming Lake in the opposing direction. The Summer Palace is on the World Heritage List. The palace grounds spread out over a vast area of hills and open water containing pavilions, halls, palaces, temples and bridges. The Summer Palace was first built in 1750, but was largely destroyed in the War of 1860 and was restored in 1896 by the Empress Dowager Sisi. Overlooking Kunming Lake, on the southern slope of the Longevity Hill is the 41 meter high tower of Buddhist incense, where the Empress Dowager Sisi would go and pray and burn incense sticks. Kunming Lake is a very shallow man-made lake that was expanded in the 18th century by a workforce of some 10,000 laborers. Today the lake is covered with a fleet of small boats ferrying people across the lake. Many of the ferries are decorated with dragon figureheads on their prows. There is an impressive steep stairway to descend the southern flank of the Longevity Hill and reach the beautiful Hall of Dispelling Clouds where the Empress Dowager Sisi officially celebrated her birthday. A couple of times out of town Chinese tourists stopped us and wanted a photo with us as they had rarely if ever seen a Caucasian in person. We pass by a massive bronze statue of a female lion that guards the gate and by the vendor selling the Obama t-shirts to catch a ferry boat. We boarded a ferry to South Lake Island with its 17 arch bridge that connects it to the eastern shore where can be found a bronze ox sculpture erected in order to protect the forbidden city from flooding. It was so hot walking around that we had to have a pea flavored popsicle. The Wen Chang Gallery houses beautiful artifacts from the Summer Palace. Near the end of the impressive 728 meter long long corridor is the amazing marble boat that was rebuilt by the Empress Dowager Sisi in 1893 using money that she diverted at China's peril from her Imperial Navy. With our visit to the Summer Palace over, we escaped the stifling heat by going underground for a return trip on the subway. The most surprising thing for us about Beijing was how very modern a city it is. Our preconception about what Beijing would be like was based on visits to Chinatowns in North America. However, this preconception quickly disappeared when the reality of modern Beijing was encountered.
He visited the stunning China Central Television headquarters building, which locals call the Big Pants for all these reasons. Beside the CCTV headquarters was the burnt-out bulk of the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, which burnt in 2009 when set alight like the towering inferno by Chinese New Year fireworks. Beijing's modern subways provide an inexpensive and easy way to move around the city, although at rush hours the subway cars are packed like sardine cans. Although Beijing is a modern city, there is no shortage of traditional manual labor. A nighttime visit to the Beijing Olympic Park was rewarding as the impressive installations constructed for the 2008 Summer Olympics are illuminated. The Beijing National Stadium, or Bird's Nest, hosted the opening and closing ceremonies, the athletics, and the football finals, while across the street the Beijing National Aquatic Center, or Water Cube, hosted the swimming, diving, and synchronized swimming events. The Linglong Pagoda housed the International Broadcast Center during the game. The lights in the area were turned off precisely at 10, after which it was difficult to find the subway entrance. The Panjiawan Flea Market started in 1992 and is now the largest and most popular market of second-hand goods and curios in China, drawing vendors from all around China. There are some 4,000 shop owners and even more shop assistants in the flea market. Because most shop owners or assistants don't speak English and we didn't speak Chinese, bartering was carried out by making offers and counteroffers on a handheld calculator. The statuary on sale at the flea market was impressive, as was the manhandling necessary to move out the statues after a sale. From Beijing, we drove north to Mutianyu to see the fabled Great Wall of China. The highways in Beijing were modern with lots of traffic on the road. Once out of Beijing, we passed by many new housing developments located in rural areas. We hiked up the mountainside to the Great Wall and walked along a portion of the wall and then took the cable car back down to the souvenir vendors. The Great Wall stretches for up to 10,000 miles with construction of the early wall starting before Christ. The Great Wall section at Mutianyu is impressive as it winds across mountainous terrain and like other sections of the Great Wall that are visited by tourists, it was restored in modern times. The Great Wall section at Mutianyu is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The cable car ride back down afforded us a good view of the wall as invaders would have seen it as they approached it. The entertaining Legend of Kung Fu show in the appropriately named Red Theater tells the story of a young boy who dreams of becoming a Kung Fu master and attaining enlightenment. We were able to take photos with some of the cast members after the production. As Beijing is rapidly modernizing, it was interesting to take a tour of the old Huhai Hutong area by pedicab. Exiting the subway near the Lama Temple, we encountered members of Beijing's SWAT team who looked like they had just stepped out of an American TV show. We met the pedicab driver on the street and as he spoke English it was simple to negotiate a price for the tour. As well as pedaling the cab, he provided a running commentary on the sights that we were seeing. Thank you.
Our pedicab tour ended near the bell and drum towers, which once dominated Beijing's skyline. Unfortunately, our tour ended a fair distance from the subway, which made for a long hike in the oppressive 40 degree centigrade Beijing heat. Our visit to the Forbidden City was an unhappy one as I was pickpocketed in front of the Emperor's throne room. We walked through the enormous Tiananmen Square on our way to the Tiananmen Gate entrance to the Forbidden City. In 1959, Mao had the square enlarged to hold over half a million people. In 1976, after Mao's death, a mausoleum farm was built at the southern end of the square. There was a huge lineup of people at the mausoleum's entrance to see Mao's entombed corpse. We bought a souvenir Mao watch from a vendor in the square. Unfortunately, we didn't try the watch and eventually found that it didn't work. However, a watchmaker at home fixed the watch and Mao now waves on the watch face. For us, the most well-known event in the square was the Tiananmen Square Democracy Movement protests of 1989, which culminated in the PLA Army's killing of several hundred protesters in the square. When we asked her guide, a Chinese national, about this, she told us that she'd never heard of the protests or the killings. We entered the Forbidden City at the Tiananmen Tower with its famous giant portrait of Mao. The Forbidden City was built at the start of the 15th century and for almost 500 years it served as the home of emperors and their household, as well as the ceremony and political center of the Chinese government. The Forbidden City was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1987. Entering via the Meridian Gate, there is a large square that is divided by the Golden Water River, which is crossed by five bridges. On the other side of the river is the Gate of Supreme Harmony, that is guarded by a pair of bronze male and female lions. Through the Gate of Supreme Harmony is the Hall of Supreme Harmony, which was the ceremonial center of imperial power and is the largest surviving wooden structure in China. The Hall of Supreme Harmony houses an imperial throne and so there was a huge throng in front of it, with people packed like sardines as they struggled to get to the front of the throng to see the throne. People were pushing and jostling one another and at some point someone picked my wallet out of my pocket. Gone with the wallet were my cash, bank and credit cards. Once I realized that I had been pickpocketed, my enthusiasm for visiting the Forbidden City diminished. Leaving the Hall of Supreme Harmony and the pickpocket somewhere in the crowd, we walked through the beautiful Imperial Garden and headed back to our hotel to cancel my bank and credit cards. This was a significant hassle. The next day we headed to the Beijing Sea Railroad Station to catch the train to Lhasa in Tibet. Take me somewhere nice To some tired island in your heart called paradise